A while ago, people wanted me to watch this video, and I said no because I know exactly what this video is going to contain, but you know what? Why not? Why not? Why not? Let's reward chat for annoying me today. We need to talk about authoritarianism from Second Thought. So th Second Thought is ostensibly the largest, like, ob like, socialist channel on YouTube, at least to my understanding. The problem is that, uh, of course, he's not actually a socialist. Second Thought is socialist in the sense that his values nominally overlap with socialists, as long as they don't contradict his primary like directive, which is to defend anti-American countries. That might seem based in Red Pilled, but when you remember that China, for example, is just doing capitalism worse than America, it's actually really damaging to socialism, like conceptually, to, to have people like launder the image of authoritarian governments and pretend that that's socialism. Uh, in his case, though, he like ideologically, he's probably closer to a fascist where in terms of like his priorities, he is willing to critique the problems with America, but only insofar as they service the defense of authoritarian countries. Um, this is like a consistent issue with a lot of people on the left, unfortunately, where the like the ideological leftist, the real leftist would be somebody who understands that the state is fundamentally incompatible with like the the marxist vision of communism like literally stateless society right so the state is at its best an inconvenient mechanism for facilitating the transition towards that society which is something that i believe i don't think we can just jump into statelessness but i do think that the state should be treated with a significant degree of like scrutiny you know because time and time and time again we've seen socialist revolutions kind of like fall or cut cut out, cut under themselves because um the people who ended up in charge just didn't do the socialism. They just empowered and enriched themselves at the expense of the proletariat. Why we need to talk about authoritarianism. Let's see. It's a long video by my standards. This episode is brought to you by Ground News. Don't care. Author by the way, apparently Second Thought and his deprogrammed podcast recently got kicked off Nebula because he made comments like justifying the murder of Israelis or something. That was pretty funny. Wait, that's uh, that's not right. Ah, authoritarianism. Truly one of the words of- This is what every, um, uh, campus red fash looks like, by the way. They are always some, like, pampered upper middle class white person who lives in the West, uh, who would never ever in a million years move over to the countries they defend, because those countries don't have freedom of speech and it would put them at, at risk, like, significant risk. So instead they will sit here in the West benefiting from our laws and our social freedoms to defend countries that are, uh, objectively worse in every possible way. Of all time. A decadent seven syllables long and wonderfully vague. If you've ever had a conversation about politics, and if you're watching this channel, I'm sure you have. The definition of authoritarianism is vague, as is the definition of all other nebulous social and political concepts. It's not really specific to the term authoritarianism. Democracy, for example, is an extremely vague term. Like, the term democracy only sort of kind of refers to like people in a system decide about the system, but like that's like there's an unlimited number of ways you can do that. You've likely heard someone use the term, or maybe... He's just going to be like, what does authoritarianism even mean in the whole video, isn't he? Yes. Um, so what he's going to be doing here is cribbing from Engel's terrible pamphlet on authority. And the basic gist of what he's going to be saying here is authoritarianism doesn't mean anything because its definition is vague and nebulous. Also, revolutions are inherently re uh, authoritarian because you're uh, forcing people to uh, do something. Yeah, dude, slave revolts are totally authoritarian. Actually, fighting authoritarianism is authoritarian as... Yeah, very stupid. And thirdly, he's going to argue that what we call authoritarianism is actually socialist societies defending themselves. You see, Stalin actually needed to criminalize homosexuality and kill, like, millions of people in order to protect socialism, the thing he definitely did. Maybe you've even used it yourself. It's popular in pretty much every corner of the mainstream political spectrum. Liberals, conservatives, the dreaded centrists, and even some lefty groups like anarchists and libertarian socialists. But hey. what does it mean? And what gives it so much weight in the political discourse? Well, that's what this video is about. We've got a pretty- Okay, a good thing that you can do with videos like this, where they try to pretend that authoritarianism isn't a real thing, is try to imagine that every argument they're making is being made by a Nazi to defend um, national socialism. So this is something I've heard from actual Nazis online. Basically, they'll say, hey, we want an Aryan society and like a white ethno state because we want freedom for our people. To which one of the million counter arguments you could make is, how is it freedom for your people if you want a like dictator with ultimate authority over the country, even if it so like claims to represent the interests of white people, which isn't really possible. Uh, like, because white people aren't all the same person, like, they have different needs and interests. Uh, how is it freedom if you have, like, one single dictator? To which their answer is, how is it authoritarianism 
if the dictator is doing the things you want. That's the central argument that they make, and that's the central argument he's going to make. I haven't seen this video, but I know I'm right because I'm smarter than this guy, and my brain contains the content of his in the junk drawer. The basic argument will be like, actually, it's not really authoritarianism if the people like the authoritarianism you're doing, because then you're just doing what they want. This is a common argument people will make with North Korea, China, or Assad in Syria. How can you say it's authoritarianism if they have such high approval ratings? Ignoring the million counter arguments like, hey, if they have like ultimate control of society and they can purge dissidents, doesn't that mean they can control what people think of them? Why would people say they dislike them if there are consequences to disliking them? How, what, if they control the media, couldn't they like skew people's opinions? Like there's a million things you can say to that. Poor understanding of what authority is here in the West, but I bet we can fix that. Sorry, I feel like I just like debunked the whole video before even watching it, but like, okay. Let's start with the generally accepted definition. Authoritarianism, favoring or enforcing strict obedience to authority, especially that of the government, at the expense of personal freedom. Okay, this is a pretty bad definition if we're being honest. It mentions the government in there, but doesn't really commit to being political, just kind of, uh, when you want people to follow the rules. That's not super helpful when we're trying to nail down a- This is stupid. If you try to take any political concept and bake it into a single one sentence definition, it's ne you're never going to get anything that works. Socialism, can't do it with that because it's actually quite complicated. Capitalism, democracy, authoritarianism, like literally, like th this is just a, a waste of time. In fact, I'm going to skip it. Let's see, let's, I want to wait for him to get to the actual arguments. Heavily used and the favorite fan and theme without whom the alpinism. No. Same idea, if Kami as a slur has been superseded by tanky in the last few years. Same idea, different era. No, tanky is a term that was made in the 50s to uh, smear people who defended the Soviet Union after they violently cracked down on the um, uh, uh, attempted Hungarian independence from the Soviet Union. Tanky is not a new term, it just describes this guy. This is the same argument that people will make, uh, like people on the far right will make, where they say, like, by racist, they actually mean pro-white. Um, it, uh, it is a way to, like, diminish the perceived meaning of a term by saying that it actually means a good thing, but people are using it in a negative way, euphemistically. Both of these words, authoritarian and totalitarian, have been leveled at fascism and communism, <coughs> often in a direct attempt to conflate the two. This is largely due to the US's extreme anti-communism post-World War II, to the point that they'd lump in their former friends, the people without whom the Allies could not have won the war, with what most people believe to be the greatest evil in history. Is he implying that the term tanky was created by, like, American feds and not by anti-Soviet communists in the 1950s and 60s who became disillusioned with Soviet communism after they crushed, like, independent dissidents? Like, yeah, dude, the FBI in the 60s was totally using the term tanky. That was, like, the, they, de that was definitely their main go-to. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good. People use a political term vaguely to demonize their opponents. Big surprise. But we still need some specifics. What exactly makes a state authoritarian? Well, if you have a scroll through the comments of just about any political video that talks about socialism, you'll find people ready with their pre-written list of objections. Please, oh my god. Notice the well poisoning as well. Rather than presenting his own opinion, he has to go on these like long spiels about how we're two and a half minutes in and he hasn't actually given his opinion. Usually bundled under the prime objection, that's authoritarian. Things on that list include the existence of large prisons or labor camps, a covert police force, state media, a strongman leader, censorship, that's- Why did he show NPR as an example of, like, authoritarian state media? Is that really the best example we could come up with? Person who likes North Korea and China? A covert police force, state media, a strongman leader, censorship, that sort of thing. And to be fair, all those things do sound scary, and none of them are ideal. I think we can all agree that we'd love to live in a society where prisons didn't need to exist. Wait, why Why does this guy dislike the idea of state media? The, he's he, This guy is literally one of those communism is when the government controls everything, guys. Why Why would he... Wait, does he want privately controlled media? Wait, genuinely, what is... Wait, from his perspective, what does that mean? That, that, that doesn't make any sense. The societies that he defends all have state media. What is he, is he implying he wants it to be private? Or is he arguing that in this specific case, for media specifically, it shouldn't be state controlled, it should actually be controlled like independently by the workers, which is something that he doesn't agree with with everything else. I, I don't know. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. He's saying it sounds bad. Oh, he's going to like defend p prisons and secret police. I guess we Before should just Before we go watch. any further, I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to attack anyone here. The objection to authoritarianism is present in a lot of different camps. People may define it a little differently. For example, a libertarian might call seatbelt laws authoritarian, while a liberal might consider the influence of the church on the government authoritarian. Oh my Meanwhile, my anarchist Please friends get... are yelling from the back of the room that the very existence of a state is authoritarian and we need to abolish bedtime. Again, 
teasing. No offense intended. Yeah, uh, the the belief that states are inherently authoritarian, a belief held by anarchists, bedtime haters, and Karl Marx. I I love how uh, this is another like big tanky thing. They have to not like they have to pretend they haven't disagreed with Marx at every level of their political prescription. You know what I mean? I know it's like a joke or whatever, but they do actually believe this. Like, Karl Marx advocated for a stateless society, and they just completely, like, they just bull right over that. Okay, we all on the same page? Authoritarianism is a red flag for a lot of people, and there are some specific Please objections we can your actual consider. positions. So, let's consider them. Here's what we're going to do for the rest of the video. First, we'll look at the list of objections as understood by liberals. Oh and I mean that God. in the broadest sense. Liberals as in subjects of liberal states, not in the conservative versus liberal sense. Then we'll look at those same objections as understood by the left. Again, pretty broadly speaking. Basically everyone from social democrats and beyond. Then finally, we'll consider a better way to understand authority and authoritarianism. What did Karl Marx write about bedtime? If you read what the intelligence services had to say about him, you would learn that Karl Marx actually also f hated bedtime. Sound good? This is one of the big red flags for me for video essays, and it's something video essayists in particular love to do, not not like live streamers or debaters or whatever, which is they poison the fuck out of the well before giving their actual opinions. It's not bad to introduce a concept before giving your opinions, but considering the way this video is made and the subject at hand and the positions I know he has, it's like, let's spend like 15 minutes equivocating and gesturing so we can pretend that a liberal democracy and like Stalin's government are the same level of authoritarian. And only then can we present kind of like a, you know, like a watered down, uh, you know, both sides -y conclusion. All right, liberal friends, I've got a pretty good idea of the kinds of places you feel are authoritarian. Top of the list, Soviet Union, the big one. Perhaps the target of the most intense smear campaign in history. Then we've got Cuba, China, North Korea, and likely a handful of other projects. But I think it's safe to say that these are the big ones. Notice how he's not mentioning one of the main societies people would call authoritarian, the Nazis. The reason he's doing that is because this guy is pro-authoritarian and anti-socialist. You can't be an authoritarian socialist. He doesn't want to mention the Nazis here, which is one of the societies anyone would mention when talking about authoritarianism, because he wants to paint the term authoritarianism exclusively as an anti-communist slur. He doesn't want to discuss the similarities between, say, the way the socialists in the Soviet Union and the way the Nazis handled their own, you know, state secrets, secret police, imprisoning of political officials, purging of dissidents, ethnic removals, and that sort of thing. Direct comparisons between the Soviet Union and the Nazis usually makes the Soviet Union look way worse than people like him wanted to. Spoiler, he's going to call protests and revolutions as autocratic later in this video. I know, I know, I've read On Authority. It's a terrible, terrible pamphlet. I know, I've already said, I already know what this video contains. When you look at any of these projects, it's not difficult to see the one thing they all have in common. They're all socialist. And when you see, see again, again, look, he's not mentioning Nazism. I wonder why, because he's trying to paint authoritarianism as like this liberal fed like term used exclusively to smear socialists, as opposed to it being like a description of tendencies these societies shared with other authoritarian governments like the Nazis. See this, it's not entirely unreasonable to come to the conclusion that authoritarianism is a core feature of socialism. We'll address this a bit more thoroughly in a few minutes, but suffice it to say that in the West, we may have a slightly biased opinion on the matter, through no fault of our own. We've just been subjected to nearly a hundred years of Red Scare propaganda at this point. Everything we're taught growing up in the Imperial Corps, especially- Is he, like, are we even gonna mention the Nazis? Again, like, it's, it's just so strange to argue that, like, well, like, what, what shared tendencies might these societies have had with the Nazis? That would, because if he mentioned the Nazis, or, like, Pinochet, or Mussolini, or Franco, or whatever, then he would have to go, oh, well, actually, the secret police the Nazis had were bad, but the secret police that Stalin had were good. The, the, again, he doesn't want a direct comparison there, because if he had one, he would have to then explain how the versions of socialism that he defends are different from the very similar problems with, like, Nazism. And of course, that's because they're both fascist governments. The Soviets, fascist. North Korea, fascist. Uh, the Nazis, fascist. Cuba, not fascist. I don't feel comfortable calling Cuba fascist. Cuba, they're trying, okay? They're, they're trucking along, all right? They're doing their best. Let's not, let's not worry about it. In the U.S. points us towards the conclusion that communism is evil and capitalism is righteous. But here's the part where I'm going to have to ask you to be willing to consider some unpleasant truths. And I don't say these things to engage in whataboutism or because I'm anti-American or something. <laughs> really preempting the uh, comments there, huh? Quite the contrary. 
I believe that in order for any country to live up to the standards it sets for others, it needs to soberly reflect on the facts. And the facts indicate that everything we're taught about these awful authoritarian socialist countries, we are also guilty of, and often to a far greater degree. Yep, and here's the part where like, ah, well, North Korea does these things, but have you considered that America does them too? Let me elaborate. One thing that rarely gets the attention it deserves is how we talk about authoritarianism. And I mean that literally, like the very words we use. Take the DPRK. We never hear about the government of North Korea. We hear about the Kim regime. This is common when Westerners talk about non-capitalist governments. Or it's it's because they have a monarchy. They have a dynasty. They, they have a... Okay. Or even capitalist ones that aren't vassal states of the US. They have a regime. We and our allies have a government. The way we talk about different systems goes a long way towards coloring our perception of them. People criticize labor camps or secret police or any number of other scary authoritarian words. But here's the thing. We have those too. And if you look at the data... Yep, see? Remember? I said this. <clears throat> ...often to a far greater extent than any socialist project in history. We just don't call them by those names. We don't have secret police, we have plainclothes officers. Or those are not the same things, oh my f god. Plainclothes officers are literally just regular police officers who are in plainclothes. Secret police have additional permissions. They show up to your house in the middle of the night and black bag you. The idea... Okay, this guy is unironically arguing that the SS and plain clothes officers are like the same thing. This is the level of insanity that you have to operate at in order to make the kinds of arguments that he believes in. Like, oh yeah, dude, a cop, but who is wearing a jacket with a wire underneath it is the same as somebody who has basically unlimited political permission to disappear you and operates under a different set of rules than regular police. A better example would be, what about federal agents? To which the answer is, the FBI has done some secret police -y shit before, worked with police officers to say, like, assassinate Frederick Hampton. But if you take a look at the numbers, uh, like the Soviet Union and the Nazis used secret police to disappear or kill hundreds of thousands of people. They were a terror. Like, people would literally, like, seize up and not talk about how they didn't like their political leader because they were afraid the secret police might be in the same bar as them. That This is, like, the origin of a bunch of Soviet jokes. You have, like, regular Soviet citizens wandering around and, like, they'll keep quiet about all their complaints because they never know who's listening and who's writing things down. Over here in America, you can complain about Biden as much as you want. No plainclothes officer is suddenly going to emerge in the middle of the night and disappear your entire family. Uh, again, like the, the, the degree of, of like unseriousness in these comparisons is so insane that I feel this should be disqualifying for most people like watching this. It should be like, okay, wow, this guy's insane. <laughs> like there's no comparison here. BLM leaders absolutely got black bagged and disappeared. No, there were people at BLM protests who got taken away and then dropped off without any like proper procedure. That's really bad. But can we please not pretend that's like what the f Stasi or the Gestapo did? Like literally, j you can literally just go on like the Wikipedia page of what they did and be like, hmm, I wonder, let me make these comparisons. It's like, ah, there was this like weird f series of protesters who got bagged, identified, then dropped off during the BLM protest. That's really bad. That's authoritarian for sure. But then like, let's take a look at what the f Gestapo did. It's like, hmm, ah, I see. Killed enough people to fill up an entire, like, army of mass graves. Yeah, it disappeared you in the middle of the night. Yeah, mm, you know. Like, it's just, like, it's, I feel like when it comes to comparisons between countries, tankies, and when I say tanky, I mean fascist, essentially. A fascist who just defends other states than, like, traditional American fascists do. They kind of rely on you not knowing what these societies did or what the secret police did. Or the intelligence community. We don't have gulags, we have detention centers. That's because those are two different things. The gulags were prison centers to which political dissidents were sent. Detention centers are the, uh, the interim facilities that migrants are kept in while they're either like waiting to be kicked out or given their papers and brought in the migration process. Those are two different... Wait, does he think that American political prisoners are sent to detention centers? Like, if you go in the street and criticize the Biden regime, a, a plainclothes police officer will black bag you and take you to, like, El Paso or something? Like, what? Again, like, political analysis. Check Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay isn't a detention center on our border. It's the f illegal uh, 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 prison camp we run. At a, that's a different thing. If he wanted to compare gulags and Gitmo, he should have compared gulag and Gitmo. To which I would say, yeah, Gitmo is really f bad. How many people are in Gitmo? Don't get me wrong, I'm not here to defend Gitmo, but the gulags, there were more of them than one. 
Like, if you want to argue, it's like, oh, okay, so the Soviet Union had hundreds of Guantanamo Bays. It's like, and then he'd be like, no, 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 no. Actually, Guantanamo Bay is much worse. Like, that's how you know there's no real comparison here. It's like, oh, well, see, America does this too. And you're like, wait, the Soviet Union had 5,000 Guantanamo Bays? And then it's like, no, 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 no. A actually, actually, it's totally different, actually, you know. I mean, Vosh, the U.S. had more than a couple black sites. So we're going to, we're, I'm going to say this one more time before I just start banning people, okay? If you want to look for any specific instance of bad thing America has done, American, like, feds have assassinated people. Do you think that compares to what the Soviets did or what the Nazis did? If it's like, uh, sure, well, they may have killed, like, a million people, but, like, here's a well-known case from 1967 where the feds killed, like, let's be real here, okay? People always, in, in their effort to demonstrate their lefty cred and how intellectual and educated they are, they leap to explain how America has done bad things, too. And you know what? We have. But holy shit, you are missing the forest for the trees if you can't see the difference. Like, basically every government, every modern government, has been participatory in some degree of, like, extrajudicial assassination. It's not good. It's what an anarchist might argue, there's something inherently authoritarian about the state, you know? But, like, if someone say, hey, the Holocaust was like the death of 10 million people, and you were like, uh, did you know the FBI killed Frederick Hampton? Maybe we're not so different, though. <laughs> like... You're being a dumbass. Which, by the way, housed far more inmates than the Soviet Union ever did. And of course we- Well, America has a larger population than the Soviet Union. And also, like, people who were sent to the gulags tended to be there longer than a lot of the people who are in our jails and prisons, because a lot of them are only in there for a short time and there's high turnover. And also, what they get sent there for kind of matters. Because you can criticize the government here. Vosh, to prove your point from Wiki, in a 1993 study of archival Soviet data, a total of 1.05 million people died in the Gulag from 1934 to 1953. Ah, yeah, that's the reason why there were fewer people in the Gulags. They just died there. <laughs> nice. We don't have slave labor. We have penal labor. We penal labor is really, really, really bad, and it definitely is a form of slave labor. I don't want to equate it to, like, chattel slave labor because there are some pretty big differences. But I, I won't I won't deny, yeah, for sure. A, bi a big part of our prison system is just like getting slave labor out of prisoners, for sure. Yeah, 100%. We put inmates to work manufacturing hand sanitizer during a pandemic or fighting fires because enshrined in the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, slavery is illegal except as punishment for a crime. That's true. You might notice that right now he is defending quote-unquote socialist societies by saying, well, America does it too. Like, keep in mind that what we're looking at right now fundamentally is a kind of whataboutism. Do you think he would accept this under any other circumstances? Like, I bet you this guy is like super duper against penal labor here in the United States. But then if it's over in North Korea with their labor camps, he would be like, ah, well, actually, by betraying the revolution, they need time to prove their loyalty back to the people. Like, this is why the whataboutism is kind of faltering, because then you'd go, oh, wait, so you defend these elements of the societies that you're arguing in favor of? And he'd be like, no, 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 well, actually, they're different, you know. <laughs> And a lot of the time, that crime is just being poor. A parking ticket you couldn't pay. Getting caught with the same drug a rich person uses, but you don't have the money to buy yourself out of trouble. I, we don't have a minute. I, I, I don't think that the majority of people in prison are in prison because they couldn't pay their parking tickets. But yeah, whatever. We have too many people in prison. Whatever. History of war, we have a Department of Defense. Despite never once fighting a defensive war. What about the Confederacy? Bam, got him. Uh, wait, who, who the f*** cares about other countries having something called a Ministry of War? What? Who's ta what? Who cares? Every military action taken by the United States, from bombing hospitals to drone striking foreign citizens, is given the cover of defense. We don't have... Yeah, that's... I, I, this is a euphemism that essentially all... That, that essentially all countries do, for one. And for two, not all of our wars have been offensive. I mean, World War II? Like, a little bit? Maybe? Wasn't it originally called the Department of War? Uh, yeah. Yes, originally the Defense Department was called the Department of War, and then the American government learned the concept of optics. Also, is he... Con Wait. State media or propaganda, we just have news. Those news outlets are, of course, all owned by the same corporate interests who funnel millions of dollars a year into government pockets to make sure their profits are secure. That's true. Okay. And their anchors dutifully repeat the ruling class's ideological positions. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. And this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. Okay. I might be reaching a little bit here. I don't know what they're referring to when they say this is extremely dangerous to our democracy, but I feel like there's something kind of fundamentally sinister about a fascist, second thought, using 
clips of media personalities saying something is a threat to our democracy as an indication that our media is illegitimate. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, without any other context, it really seems like exactly what you'd see from a fascist video, you know? Like, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Jewish media all repeats the exact same lies to you, Goyim, whatever, blah, blah. Like, uh, it, the, the, the way the arguments are iterated, their guys are dictators, ours are presidents. Their that, yeah, yes, that is how it works. If one of them is unelected and one of them is elected. This was from a John Oliver or Daily Show segment, if I recall correctly, about the Sinclair Media Group. Oh, okay, okay, wait, I remember that. I remember that. Okay, yeah. Their state has a regime, ours has a government. We are free and happy, they're oppressed and miserable. Our nuclear arsenal is for deterrence. Theirs is a threat to global peace. Dis well, North Korea constantly threatens to nuke their neighbors, so that would actually be the case based on their words. Like, like taking the North Korean government's word for it, they are threatening with it. Is bro just anti-democracy? Yes, he is. Despite the US being the only country on Earth to have ever used nuclear weapons, and we did it twice, on civilians, on purpose. Uh-huh. Yeah, what a, this is such a soy argument, dude. Like, hey, did you know 80 years ago we nuked Japan? Ignore everything that's happened since then. Ignore everything. Like, ignore the entire Cold War with, like, the mutual, like, nuclear buildup and threats to end the world. Ignore the fact that countries like North Korea constantly threaten to nuke their neighbors, that Russia constantly threatens to nuke their neighbors. Like, ignore everything. Did you know 80 years ago we ended World War II by nuking uh, Japan? Did you know that? Did you know that? We have a democracy. They have a dictatorship. True. Despite, by all accounts, places like Cuba and China having far more representation and opportunity for democratic involvement than places like the U.S. Gigantic citation needed? Just li like, wh by what metric? By what measure? Just saying that? Okay. So the way we talk about government structures, characteristics, and actions matters. Without if, you, if you try to form a union in China, it gets broken up by the government, and you can't run as a different party. You can only run as a member of the Communist uh, Party. And the Communist Party will only, like, allow people to run if they've been chosen and approved by the party. There is literally no representation outside of what is permitted by the current leadership. Cuba is a bit different. Cuba has a much more robust civil society. They still have an undemocratic government, that is true. But, like, man, it's so complicated. My understanding of Cuba's government is that there is definitely a pretty strong authoritarian trend to it. But that authoritarianism isn't as nakedly self-serving as, like, the the Chinese governments, you know? Like, Cuba's authoritarianism seems more like a kind of inertial force based on its precedent, more of a, like, this is how we've done things and we're trying our best, whereas the Chinese Communist Party so obviously and so cynically consolidates power within itself that it, it's not, like, this accidental inertial thing. It's very clearly, like, a deliberate decision to subvert the, um, you know, the perceived socialist will of the country. Without even knowing it, we can end up falling prey to some very subtle, very sophisticated propaganda that primes us to hate people we've never met, whose economic and government structures we know nothing about, and with whom we share far- Don't fall for American propaganda, okay? Fall for Russian propaganda. <laughs> Stop listening to Westoid propaganda and start repeat repeating Kremlin uh, <laughs> talking points, okay? Let's go. Far more in common than we do with our own leaders. Okay, fine, but those are just words. Who cares what we call our stuff? All right, let's talk specifics. In a striking 2012 article by Adam Gopnik called The Caging of America, the author notes that, quote, Overall, there are now more people under correctional supervision in America, more than 6 million, than were in the gulag under Stalin at its height. So, again, this, for one, is not a direct comparison because the gulag and people under correctional supervision is not the same category. For two, we have a larger population. For three, they weren't treated the same. For four, what got them there is different. Again, so the, I feel like the content of this video is already completely disqualifying because you know that he has to avoid answering certain very important questions in order for his comparisons to make sense. Does anyone else feel like, I, I feel like it's almost an insult to myself to have to go over a video and like give arguments against the bullshit he's saying when he opened with plainclothes police officers and the Gestapo are the same thing. That it's, that's an indication that he is so willing to just annihilate any technical differences, like anything, just completely smooth over any comparisons until he has massaged the argument into sh suiting the exact, like, ends that he looks for. And now we see it again, right? He did it before with the, with the, um, with the gulags. Hold on. How many Americans have died in prisons? All right. About 5,000 deaths per year, more or less, give or take. Um, which means that if you extrapolate that out for the past 80 years, 
that would be what like 400,000 deaths which is less than half what the gulags did in 20 years despite having a lower like participatory population all right there we go we did it we proved socialism is fake or something and this is coming from an american writer with a thoroughly liberal worldview it's a poignant comparison because as we all know stalin gulags and the soviet union are the trifecta of what the average person sees as authoritarianism the fact that we're doing worse than that, even if you buy the inflated numbers of widely debunked books like the Black Book of Communism, should tell you something. You don't have to buy the bullshit from the Black Book of Communism in order to know that the Soviet Union, China, etc. are not socialist countries and did a lot of bad things. And fun fact, the CIA wrote a report in the 50s that the whole Stalin strongman thing was largely a myth. It was just a very useful myth to the capitalist powers, so why not perpetuate it? But I We gonna substantiate that? No, they didn't. What, what the American intelligence services said was that there was a very high likelihood that a significant portion of the political power in the Soviet Union was wielded by Stalin's cabinet, not just by Stalin. This is the case in all governments. Obviously, you can't literally have one single leader do everything. In the whole Soviet Union, no human could manage all of that. You have a cabinet of people who also do a lot themselves. The same is the case for every government in existence. Essentially, what the, what the, um, the CIA was saying was, yeah, Stalin has a ton of power, but like here are all the other authoritarians under him who has a lot of power. And what tankies like Second Thought do is they use this as an argument that it was democratic. Like, the reason he didn't elaborate there is because he wants the impression that you get from that to be, oh, Stalin wasn't a strong man. He was actually a glorious people's democratic leader. When in reality, it was just, oh, he actually shares power with a cabinet of like very, um, very powerful officials who live like kings in the Soviet Union. You know, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to elaborate because it would make him look bad because, again, like blow over all details, sand down every difference, compare, compare, compare. It's amazing how many euphemisms are needed to make these arguments work. Yeah, it's really, really bad. It makes me dude. this shit makes me so arrogant. The people who dislike me act like this, you know, like what? Like people are like, dude. Vosh, you just repeat State Department propaganda, and then I have to watch a video from, like, ostensibly the largest socialist YouTuber, and it's like, yeah, plainclothes police officers were like the Gestapo. Dude, like, come on. Holy shit. I know what you're thinking. Everybody knows the U.S. has a thing for prisons. That's, like, one thing we could ease back on a little bit. That doesn't make the country authoritarian. Let's continue, then. How about surveillance? It's pretty widely believed that citizens of socialist states are the subject of extreme surveillance. But what if I told you that none of them hold a candle to the US? Don't believe me? Take a look at Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Thanks to this piece of legislation, every single person in the United States is the subject of incredibly intense scrutiny. We have a mass surveillance program that allows for the collection of phone conversations, text messages, emails, web searches, and social media messages. This is Everything also dishonest, is and I'll explain why. First of all, notice how the term he just used was allows for. Obviously, it's the modern day, and America is super advanced. We have abilities with surveillance that are unmatched by the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union stopped existing 30 years ago. So that as much is clear. They have the ability and the legal right to do a lot of surveillance. The question is, what surveillance do they actually do, and what are the outcomes of that surveillance? And a critical difference here is that while the United States government has the ability to peruse an ungodly amount of our data, we don't live in constant terror that any errant comment about our dear leader, President Biden, is going to lead to us getting blackbagged. I need you guys to read accounts of what it was like living in the Soviet Union or under the Nazi Germany and compare them to what we have going on here. Or hell, China today. You literally cannot risk making dissident comments because while we may have the technical permission to engage in high levels of surveillance for our civilians the practical matter like the 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 the, the actual like fact of life the the state of affairs present like what is actually going on is that most of those permissions are just high level tech data encryption stuff it's like the government having the ability to appear on specific people of interest whereas in the soviet union they had entire archives of data on suspected dissidents that people would constantly peruse through and update. Like, I, I need you guys to understand, we're talking like secret police in, 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 in Berlin or in Moscow that would go to local events, that would hang out at bars, that would make friends with people and just record and document thousands and thousands of pages on data looking to bust so-called political dissidents. Now, that was technically more low-tech than what we can do now, because again, it was like 80 years ago, obviously. 
but the practical consequence of the surveillance was much more rigorously uh, uh, sort of exercised and made real then than it is now. Nobody in the United States today lives in fear that criticizing the government will lead to them getting arrested, with the exception of like insane conservative preppers who live out in the woods and have 50 trillion guns. Like, and they're lunatics, all right? Hopefully we're not stooping to that depth. It is true the government has these powers, and it is true that the government does engage in a lot of like, um, like surveillance and protest groups. I'm not saying the government doesn't do any real surveillance, but again, like, a very basic reading of history will give you so much understanding as to how different these actual practical realities are. Yeah, like the radical dino says, for sure. Like, if you're an actual leftist in China, you have to be careful about what messages you send people. Over here in the United States, you can be a full communist and you can just say whatever, dude, outside of overt threats to people in power. And even then, like, people getting in trouble for that is pretty like spotty even then like you can literally be like i want the government toppled i think that biden is hitler i think that they blah, 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 blah. and you can just say that scream it from the rooftops text to everyone facebook put whatever and like you're not gonna get black bagged in the middle of the night dog you're you're not you're you're just not i just don't think this again like this is just another one of those like you don't appreciate it until you don't have it things a lot of people in the west don't seem to understand how much they benefit from the freedom of speech that they wouldn't have if they moved to these other countries even the like tepid half-assed wishy-washy whataboutism criticisms that western lefties make of china sometimes like the shit that hassan says about china if he went over to china and lived in china he would get arrested for it or at least be subjected to like significant political pressure that's because over here in america we do have freedom of speech in the west we do have freedom of speech at least certainly more than they do over there and i think these western lefties these tankies know that because otherwise why not move there since you brought it up earlier china has black bag members of picking universities marxist society that tried to help jsuk workers start an independent union yeah P police cracking down on and disappearing labor advocates because they were trying to help form a union do you know how long it's been since american feds cracked down on and disappeared union workers for trying to create a union it's been a while since we've been in those days nowadays we just have like repressive laws but over in China, you can get the classic early 20th century experience. Monitored. But wait, it's called the Foreign Surveillance Act, so why are we in the crosshairs? Well, it started out as a way to keep tabs on communications between U.S. citizens and foreign nationals deemed a threat of some kind. But over the last decade or so, the scope of the project has- Videos like this just really remind me of the way that, um, Republican fascists will occasionally tepidly criticize things in America, like inflation or high healthcare costs, but it's only in the service of their own radical authoritarian ideology. Like, there are Nazis who will be like, yeah, our media is corrupt and healthcare costs too much. And what they're trying to do is win over your sympathy by appealing to arguments that you also share, but their end game is another Holocaust, right? Whereas for a second thought, he's like, hey, you have all these criticisms of our government, right? You criticize our involvement in the Vietnam War. You think that it's bad that we surveil our own citizens. So why don't you come defend Russia with me? It's like their criticisms of these systems are superficial and only because they're American. Every system of comparison, like, for instance, again, you have to imagine that he's here, okay? He is doing this whataboutism in a, as a way of, like, defending the Soviet Union, of defending China, right? So then wouldn't you go up to him and ask, hey, if you're so critical of America's surveillance program, what about all of the open, on-the-book surveillance programs the Chinese government has, which are much worse, much more wide-ranging, allow them to do much more? The, like, what, what about those? How often do you criticize those? The answer is they don't, because he doesn't care about them. He's fine with those. Those aren't American. Expanded dramatically. What was once strictly a counterterrorism tool, which is already incredibly vague and dangerous, has now morphed into a domestic surveillance apparatus where... It was never just a counterterrorism tool. The NSA provides this data to the CIA and the FBI, which they can use to open investigations into any person in the country without a warrant. But As opposed to the Chinese government. So again, do we actually have an issue with this surveillance, or do we only mind it when it's in America? What if we want to give U.S. intelligence agencies the benefit of the doubt? Why? They're just doing their job, right? If you're not a criminal- No, who says this? Well, you have nothing to hide. According to a 2022 report, the FBI and CIA conduct millions of these backdoor searches for no legitimate reason. They've pulled- Yeah, no shit. How many people get arrested for it? How many people get black bagged for it? Data on family members, journalists, political commentators, even government officials. For what reason? Who knows? They want dirt on a politician they don't like, so they read their Twitter DMs. They saw you in a coffee shop and thought- Dog, I bet you that Chinese leftists wish 
that the Chinese government stopped at just looking at their data, you know? You are cute and ask the barista for your name. That's all they need. Some random intelligence creep can plug in your name, phone number, or email address and have access to years of your personal communications, web activity, address, personal details, all of it. No authoritarian regime in history has ever wielded that kind of surveillance power. Yeah, because the internet didn't exist back. The Chinese government can do this. They do it more openly. They, they do it like incredibly openly, right? Wait, is he suggesting that there's something innately sinister and authoritarian about the government having the ability to search your address? What? You, they already know that, dog. You pay taxes. What? what? Wait, he's literally like, uh, the government can find out your address if they need to. D really? Is that true? I'm shocked. Yeah, me, me, when the federal agent tells me he knows my address, me already knowing it. <laughs> so, like, yeah, oh, wow, very impressive. Can't, can't believe I'm getting doxxed by um, the federal government. My Chinese friend was traveling to China recently. She had to use a VPN just to talk on Discord. Ain't got to do that here. I, again, like, it's just, it's so stupid. It, knowing anything about these systems makes it clear that not only do we have it better, but that he doesn't give a shit that they have it worse, you know? A real socialist would never engage in this kind of defense. You can criticize America for all of its bad policies and the bad stuff that it does without, like, doing a whataboutism to implicitly defend through dishonesty the behavior of the non-socialist Chinese government or the Soviet government or whatever. Like, if you want, again, you want to look up, like, number of people black bagged or disappeared and number of people, like, arrested for political speech. Like, it's so clear. I, I bet you that Second Thought, as an example of, like, oh, you think only China arrests people for political speech? Look at all of these January 6th protesters who were arrested. Now, you may say that you agree with the uh, arrests and you may think the January 6th protest was bad. January 6th wasn't good. But you cannot deny this was an example of... Because, like, he doesn't have any values outside of the equivocation to defend those foreign states. If I'm being charitable, I think the purpose of pointing this out is to point out the people who only criticize China probably aren't aware we have our own f***ed up surveillance state, too. Nah, dude, imagine if someone was like, oh, you criticize the Nazis? You think the Holocaust was bad. Did you know that American government officials have killed people, too? Wouldn't that be, like, kind of weird? Like, hold on a second. Hell, uh, hold on a second, channel that does a ton of videos defending Nazi Germany. Are you really making a video that's trying to incisively criticize an element of America's government? Or are you just doing whataboutism to equivocate our society and their much worse society as a way of defending theirs, you know? Like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's, it's just really indicative. There's, if you want to challenge lies about China, like Western lies about China or whatever, then why lie more about China? And if you want to criticize American behavior, why equivocate it with stuff that it's not comparable to? Why equivocate gulags and detention centers? What the fuck? What is that? It doesn't even make sense. Those are totally different things. He just grabbed for sinister sounding names the new lefties would buy into. That's the whole point of this video. Take baby lefties who don't know that much about socialism and try to groom them into believing that the way to be a socialist is to, um, is, is, is to like support fascism, but red, you know? That's the whole point. Take, take baby socialists who know that American prison system shit is f***ed up, who know that our detention centers are f***ed up, and then get them saying like, ah, well, hmm, if you can agree those things are bad, then won't you agree that these other things are actually not that different? And it's like, yeah, it's like, f*** man, it's so slimy. Has he said read on authority yet? He's going to at some point in this video. Okay, dystopian prison population, larger surveillance apparatus. Notice how, again, he still hasn't actually made a prescriptive statement. We're more than halfway into the video. In history, that all sounds pretty bad. But at least we have the freedom to criticize the government, right? Oh my god! Soviet political prisoners. Number of. Should have said that. Population of the Gulag camps amounted to 1.5 million. Wait, what was, what was the population of the Soviet Union in 1940? About 200,000, though they lost a lot of people during the war. 1.5 million people in the gulags. That is crazy. Jesus Christ. I didn't actually know it was that many. A further 6 to 7 million were deported and exiled to remote areas of the USSR. 4, 4 to 5 million passed through labor colonies. 3.5 million who were already in or had been sent to labor settlements. Historian Orlando Figes refers to 25 million prisoners of the gulag in 1928 to 1953. Some historians estimate 14 million people were in prison. Dude, holy shit! That, like, a significant portion of the Soviet population. Well, that's pretty wacky. Hold on. Um, Soviet Stalin purges. Just really quickly, because I, I the, before the whataboutism, I just really think it's important that we set some context here so that we can, like, make these comparisons in slightly better faith, okay? 
The Great Terror and the Yezhovshim was Joseph Stalin solidifying his power of the Communist Party by killing a huge number of people. Sergei Kirov was assassinated. His death led to an investigation that revealed a network of party members supposedly working against Stalin, including several of Stalin's rivals. Um, da, 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 began the purges, the Great Purge. The purges were largely conducted by the NKVD. Oh, okay, so this is what the secret police can actually do. The secret police of the USSR. They began the removal of the central party leadership, the old Bolsheviks, government officials, and regional party bosses. So this is just him killing political enemies. They, they didn't do any crimes. They were just more aligned with Lenin's vision of the Soviet Union than Stalin's. Eventually, the purges were expanded to the Red Army and Military High Command, which had a disastrous effect in the military. Right before World War II. Very smart. Three successive trials were held in Moscow that removed most of the old Bolsheviks and the challenges to Stalin's position. As the scope of the purge began widening, the omnipresent suspicion of saboteurs and counter-revolutionaries began impacting civilian life. Again, keep in mind, there were no real trials. Being suspected of being a political dissident was all it took. And again, being suspected of being a political dissident really shouldn't be enough to get you arrested. Like, political dissidence is not in and of itself bad. The NKVD began targeting certain ethnic minorities, such as the Volga Germans, who were subjected to forced departure and extreme repression. During its mass operations, the NKVD widely utilized imprisonment, torture, violent interrogation, and arbitrary executions to solidify control. By 1938, Stalin hit the button that turned off the purges. That was nice of him. Uh, despite the Great Purge being over, the atmosphere of mistrust and widespread surveillance continued for decades after. Scholars estimate the death toll for the Great Purge, which lasted two years, to be roughly 700,000. So that's just one two-year period, and that's only deaths, not arrests, not injuries, not displacements. That's, that's uh, just the deaths. Okay, now let's listen to whatever it is Second Thought has to say. The secret police aren't going to come drag us away. Well, I've got some bad news for you there, too. U.S. police are the most vicious and unaccountable in the world by far. Citation needed. There are plenty of videos online of police arresting journalists, brutalizing peaceful protesters, even laughing about killing innocent people. I have a whole video on the subject, actually. But here's the gist of it. According to ongoing reporting, U.S. police kill over a thousand American citizens per year. A thousand people. And I can hear the objection already. Yeah, well, some of those people were probably criminals. Police are not meant to be judge, jury, and executioner. They're meant to arrest people if they have to, and then hand them over to the judge, jury, and we really should talk about the executioner part. Open social media on any day of the week, and you'll see a story of an officer-involved shooting. So this is exactly what I mean about the um, the grooming of baby socialists into fascism. So basically every left-leaning person believes that American cops are doing something wrong. There are plenty of specifics to that, and there are a lot of details on what to do about it, but the belief that the American policing system is bad is pretty universal among left-leaning people. Notice how rather than simply making this point on its own, which is a fair point to make and one I've made plenty of times, he is equivocating this to mass executions by secret police. And notice how he was previously talking about killed for political disagreements, but now he's talking about just random police violence. Notice how there's not really a comparison here. Like, the people who died a cop, first of all, most cop deaths are probably preventable, but not all. If you shoot someone who themselves has a gun, like, I think we can all agree that, like, uh, while there are reforms that should be made to the prison system and the policing system, and, like, many, many reforms, like, y the cop shooting someone who's running around a Walmart waving a gun is probably not, like, comparable to the NKVD killing your entire family because you said at a bar that you didn't like the way Stalin was handling things. Notice how he talk he went from political dissident killings just to regular police killings. And notice how he's not going to compare this to the actual number of people killed under Stalin. The reasons for this, again, it's not because he's, like, forgetting to, and it's not because he's, like, overlooking it. It's because he's okay with all the people Stalin killed. He's fine with it. He's a fascist. All of his criticisms of this, these systems, American policing, whatever, are superficial and built out of a, 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 a fundamental ideological opposition to America and American democracy principally. If he didn't feel that way, he wouldn't be defending all of these bad things and worse when done by other governments he does defend. Most of the people who watch my content, I'd like to believe, are relatively ideologically principled, like we tend to have pretty consistent values. So a lot of people don't seem to understand what it's like to be a total, utter campist, to be somebody who treats all politics like sports. I think one of the best examples of this would be Luna Oi. Luna Oi, the so-called communist uh, uh, Vietnamese woman, 
uh, is somebody who pretends that Vietnam is some kind of like communist outsider opposing Western hegemony, despite Vietnam being a close ally of the United States and an objectively capitalist country. And additionally, Luna Oi postured as a uh, ally to queer rights. And then there were L pro LGBT protests against the homophobic government in Vietnam. And she cracked, she supported the government cracking down on them and said they were color revolutions that were funded by uh, the CIA in order to overthrow the Vietnamese government, despite the Vietnamese government being an ally of the United States. The obvious, like the only way to reconcile these apparent contradictions is that Luna Oi doesn't actually have any beliefs outside being a nationalist for Vietnam. Like every other belief uh, is secondary to that. If being pro-LGBT allows her to posture as some kind of progressive revolutionary, she will. But at the end of the day, the Vietnamese government and its decisions are hers to defend. And that's that, you know, it's as simple as that. A lot of people in my community don't really understand or sympathize with that line of thinking. And that's good. That means that you're like not a monstrous piece of shit. But a lot of people do think that way, and Second Thought thinks that way. Where the media tries really hard to twist the reporting to make the cops sound less like a murderer. With body cameras often required these days, it's getting harder for them to hide their crimes, though they still try. Anyway, the bottom line is this. If we look at any other country on Earth, let's say China, the hot button supposed authoritarian hellhole of the day, and we compare police violence stats, the US is far worse. Anyone uh, remember this? American police have done a lot of bad things, but I don't remember them completely demolishing a multi-million strong protest, um, occupying an entire city and disappearing the leaders behind the, um, uh, the protests. I don't actually remember them doing that over here in America recently, unless I'm forgetting. Millions of people. Also, he thinks China's honest with their statistics. I mean, this, this guy, like, denied the Uyghur Muslim genocide and basically said, like, none of it is happening. This guy literally did, if I remember correctly, this guy literally did the, like, China, the, all the evidence of China ramping up um, surveillance in the Xinjiang province is fake and a lie, even though the Chinese government themselves say they're doing it. But also, if there are any Uyghur Muslims arrested, that's because they're terrorist sympathizers. So again, like, he, again, he doesn't have any principles. Like, the, you have to understand that. Exactly the same with regular old American fascists who lie nonstop. The only consistent belief they have, usually, is a defense of, like, the white man, right? They, they will argue any number of contradictory things as long as it brings them to what they perceive to be a defense of that, of, of, of white supremacy and of, um, uh, of, of chauvinism. In the U.S., in 2022, police killed 1,201 people. In China, that number is zero. Oh, wait. Nope, I read that wrong. Zero people killed by police since 2019, a year- Does he actually believe this shit? Okay, yeah. Hey, I just, um, I just took a look at Assad's election numbers, and uh, he got 99.999% of the vote. So actually, he's the most democratically beloved leader in history. Yeah, the Chinese government disappears people. The Chinese government and its police definitely kill fewer people than American police, but that's largely because um, civil disobedience is more common here in the United States, and we have more guns. The fact that a lot of people die to cops here is largely a product of um, a shift in police culture, which is caused by the knowledge that every American on average has three guns on them. That's not a defense of the cops. They still behave monstrously here in the United States. But yes, we do have a very disproportionate number of people killed for reasons heavily associated with the preponderance of our weapons. So, you know, there's that. Uh, however, the idea that none have been killed by police is just, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. It's, it's, it's insane. This is basically the same as an Iranian official saying that there are no gay people in Iran. Something that Russia, I believe, has said as well. There are no gay people in Iran, no gay people in Russia. It is a willful rejection of, like, not just truth, but like common sense that uh, can only serves to reveal a person's bias. Like, there's, no, there's nothing else beyond that, really. When two people were killed. Two people in five years. In a country with a population four times greater than the United States. Isn't there always manifestations in China, but it's never covered? The Chinese government disappears people. This is, like, not even slightly controversial. Also, the Chinese, like, there, there are 1.4 billion Chinese people. We know the government disappears people. We know they lie uh, in their data because they've been caught in it many times. They falsify data constantly. Uh, like, it, it, the, the, yeah, again, just... Since 2019, U.S. police have killed nearly 5,000 American citizens. So, we have a more dystopian prison situation. <laughs> uh... Hey, just a reminder that I have asked this guy to come on stream to talk about his previous videos, and he declined. He said he would only talk to me in private, and then even then he wouldn't talk to me in private. I, I wonder why. We're the most spied on people on Earth, and our police murder three people on average every single day. If that's not authoritarian, I don't know what is.
And this isn't to run defense for the excesses of past and present socialist projects. In fact, isn't it? I mean, you're equivocating. In fact, socialists are among the loudest and most well-read critics of these experiments. The program guys and I have a podcast episode specifically dedicated to the topic. Curiously, a podcast where none of you live in China. Because, of course, if you were critical of China's socialist experiment from within China, you would get arrested. You cu curiously, we are, we are also critical of the socialist project. We have to be critical of it from America, though, because the socialist project is weirdly, uh, you know, weirdly tetchy about their uh, proletarians criticizing them. And we plan to do more in the future. The point of all this is that if we're going to rightly level criticism at some states, we need to make sure to apply that standard universally. And that means starting at home rather than simply passing judgment on countries halfway around the world or that- This is wrong on so many levels. First of all, how, how the f*** can you call yourself a socialist and then, like, tut-tut people for passing judgment on the behavior of other states? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pass judgment on a 1.4 billion person controlling government. Like, like they're a teenager who's made a little f*** up that I'm being, like, mean about or something. What the f***? do you mean? Who would ever use the language past judgment when criticizing America and its faults? Notice how, again, he defends these countries by equivocating between them and the West, but then he advocates for a much stricter set of, like, form of rhetoric and engagement against Western countries than the countries that he's defending. So, again, like, this is the purpose of whataboutism, right? You, first, you take, like, a bad thing and a less bad thing. Then, you lie until they both seem about the same. But then, because you're defending the more bad thing, you keep on defending it as though it's better than the thing that you've just said it's actually equal to. That have long since passed. Israel could literally make all these whataboutisms to justify their treatment of Palestinians? Yeah, for sure. Literally, all of this works as well. Oh, you think that Israel kills people? Well, here, take a look at this history of the Hamas behavior. You could do, I've, I've seen Nazis do this as well. Oh, wow, you think the Nazi government was so bad? You know, you heard all these stories about disappearance? Well, hey, the American government does the same thing. At least the Nazi government was defending the white man. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Okay, that's the liberal part taken care of. Now it's time to have a little chat with my friends on the Western left. The right does a very good job at presenting a unified front. The capitalist class and the forces of reaction are incredibly powerful in the Imperial Corps. I can't believe you won't pull the trigger on Yugopnik for associating so strongly with this loser. Yeah, Yugopnik was cool to me in DMs before, like we talked a little bit, but I asked him about like a couple months ago to come on stream and he just didn't respond, so he's probably just as cucked as this guy is now. F him. Again, like, the they're just fascists, right? It was it was like when we looked at um like Hakeem, the other guy in the podcast, and it turns out he just wants to like murder and every like Kurdish person in in uh in like the the pan-arabic region or something uh like it's it, it, it it's so clear they're all so f terrified of d me dude Yugopnik uh ghosted me uh second thought wouldn't talk to me unless it was in private Hakim only came on to talk once and when he did he meekly agreed with everything that I had to say and then complained about it later and went back to shit talking me despite not having the balls to confront me in person it's so dude at least like non-red fascists at least like Western fascists have the balls to actually like directly stand up to criticism, you know? They lie all the time, but like at least they engage with it. So f snakish, dude. Cowards. The left is already on the back foot, and we have been for many, many years. This is why it's frankly absurd how much infighting goes on among the left. Social Democrats sniping at tankies for being authoritarian doesn't do the movement any good. Yes, it does. We shouldn't associate with the the presence of red fascists in our like uh, left coalition is the biggest thing holding us back by far, like massively. So the chains that bind the modern left to like the Soviet Union and China are the biggest things holding us back easily. One hundred percent. Say what you will about Professor Flowers, but she had the guts to talk to you on stream. No kidding. For three hours, that retard had the stomach to talk to me for three hours and these so-called like revolutionary dissident left like we're gonna sit here and laugh about israeli civilians getting killed by hamas dipshits are too cowardly to talk to me at all it's incredible like credit where credit's due funnily enough the label authoritarian is only ever applied to successful socialist projects. <clears throat> this is uh this is just classic um red fash cope 100 there is no successful socialist project at least not in the form of state the one you know, like, hey, you anarchists haven't managed to build your utopia, but look at us. We've built several authoritarian fascist governments. Clearly, we're much more effective and should be taken seriously. Look, points at the USSR and the f mountain of skeletons that it's built on. Look, we've done successful socialism. All we had to do was get rid of the socialism and the success. It collapsed, remember? The Soviet Union collapsed, remember? And Russia is like a dystopian petro-state that is kept alive only by the oil that it manages to sell to, um... 
uh, its, its neighboring governments, you know? Dude, look at China. China's doing great right now. I mean, yeah, they might, like, uh, purge political dissidency and have, like, a um, sort of crumbling political infrastructure that they're, like, consolidating into a fascist bloc by promoting anti-Maoist, um, like, old Chinese values. They might have given up on the entire, like, cultural reset and are reasserting the value of, like, ancient Chinese and Confucianist aesthetic as a way of, like, rallying the population to prevent them from challenging the government. But hey, you know, if you get rid of success and socialism, you have so many successful ML projects. ...that failed were somehow more pure. But the moment a new system takes steps to ensure the security of their people and their new project, they're labeled authoritarian. I think part of this is... I'm sorry? ...security of their people and how more pure. But the moment a new system takes steps to ensure the security of their people and their new project... ...takes steps to ensure the security. This is war on terror rhetoric right here. This, literally, this is like, uh, oh, wow. So you've taken an issue with us protecting people? Like, it, it, nice euphemism, dog. Oh, yeah, dude. What did they do exactly? A criminalizing homosexuality? Was that necessary to, uh, yeah. It does sound like 14 words rhetoric. Yeah, because it's functionally the same, you know? Uh, look at all these monstrous things I did. Oh, well, I actually did them to protect my people. He says, you know, ma socialism. But does he actually mean ma socialism when we know he's not a socialist? No. I mean, he basically just means like whatever ethnic or, or civil group he, he sort of prioritizes in the engagement. They're labeled authoritarian. I think part of this is that there's a lack of understanding among Western self-professed leftists regarding what it actually takes to change the status quo across an entire country. You have to abandon socialism first and foremost, you idiot, you dumbass. We need secret police, we need an authoritarian government, no proletarian control, no collective ownership that means production, full statehood, um, you know, we'll, we'll throw some conscription in there, no democratic rights, that's how you get it, that's, that's what you need to do. The only way to achieve socialism is to abandon socialism. This is what I mean when I say these guys are more dangerous for us than any other group, because these are the demons whispering in our ears. Hey, no good things are possible. You have criticism of the United States? Well, you know what your alternative is? North Korea, Cuba, China the Soviet Union or Russia today. Like, that's what you get. No good things are possible, actually. If you want anything that's different from what we have today, you need to accept something at best equivalent, but most likely worse. That's all you get. Every revolution, including bourgeois revolutions like the American one, are authoritarian by default. There we go. There's the, I already called this, that's the on authority. This is the idea that, like, freeing people is authoritarian because you're doing something, like, doing things is authoritarian because you're doing things... Those in power will never give up their power without a struggle. They're not going to let you vote out the very system that benefits them. To understand the nature of revolution a little better, let's... So, uh, again, like, no qualification there, no explanation as to how it's authoritarian to, like, defeat authoritarianism. Let's go back to the man himself. No, no, the other one. His sugar daddy. There we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. I wonder why we're not taking a look at the writings of Marx. Let's go to the On Authority pamphlet, yep. I wonder, I wonder why we're not taking a look at the writings of Marx. I was thinking for a second, like, why would you cite Marx here? Marx would, Marx would, Marx would not support the purges, but he would have supported Second Thought being sent to the gulags. Isn't this basically Antifa or the real fascist logic? Well, uh, well, what his, the, the arguments that this guy is making, Second Thought is making, could be equal, used equally to exonerate the Nazis. Everything that he said is just a blatant defense of the concept of, like, uh, mass murder and uh, anti-democratic action to defend the project you're calling socialism. Why not national socialism? Like, oh, like, okay, again, I'm not trying to get too deep in the weeds here, but you realize the argument that he's making. We needed to do this authoritarian, we needed these purges, we needed all this behavior to defend the revolution could, with very little ideological shifting, be used to justify the Holocaust. You realize the rhetoric for the Holocaust in Nazi Germany wasn't de her de her, we're evil, de her de her, but was rather we need to take these steps in order to protect the fatherland from the like um the the, the dissident and like seditious elements within our society. You might argue, oh, well, that was religiously and ethnically targeted. That wasn't like done against political dissidents. First of all, the first people the Nazis went after were communists. Second of all, uh, the Soviets targeted ethnic groups, deporting and killing entire regions of people, millions of people. Like, th there, this is why I say red fascist. Like, if you actually look at the bones of the ideology, the actual roots of what it means and what it does and what it defends, it's the same. It really is. It fundamentally is the same, you know? I think the Nazis were far worse, but only because they were a worse version of the same basic ideology. I, I really don't respect the idea that 
there are differences. It's capitalist realism. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't think that Second Thought believes there is any world outside of capitalism. I think that he believes it's a choice between bourgeois capitalism and state capitalism. And that uh, we, 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 we have to submit to one or the other. I don't think he believes in a socialist project. Hey, DM. To your point about tankies holding the left back, tankies even being included in any way as the left proves too many leftists really have not developed the ability to recognize and criticize fascism that doesn't come wrapped in American flag. Yeah, literally. The fact that there are, um, there are leftists who defend Assad is such a perfect example of that. Like, bro, what the f*** do you believe, actually? Like, a lot, for a lot of socialists, like, the number one belief that Marx wrote down, like, read all three chapters of Das Kapital, and what does it say written on the first page in all of them, and then nothing else on any of the other blank pages? It says America bad, and that's it. As long as what you're saying is America bad, you're doing socialism, baby. So, like, why, why does that not apply to Nazi critiques? Why does that not, like, why is that not uh, applicable to their arguments against democracy and in favor of their system? The answer is it's equally applicable. I know I'm belaboring this point, but you want me to go over this video. I got so many emails about it. Oh, Friedrich Engels. This large beard wrote a brilliant little piece called On Authority. It's terrible. Basically, all actual socialists agree that it's terrible. It's like a page long. None of you have any excuse not to read it. It's linked below. But here's the part that I think is most applicable to this video. Have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? A revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon. So yeah, the argument by Engels is that doing something that other people don't want you to do is authoritarian. This is retarded. Authoritarianism is a political system that suppresses the will of the population in favor of the will of an individual, a small set of individuals, or a class above them. Authoritarianism is not doing something other people don't want you to do. Yeah, it's drivel. It's, it's meaningless. This, yeah, the, what the term that he is thinking of here is force. A revolution certainly contains force. It is forceful. That is true but it is not authoritarian. I mean, it can be, but it's not authoritarian by definition. How is this appealing to anyone except ultra-communists? Ultra-communists wouldn't find this appealing because they're actual communists. This appeals to disillusioned, uh, like, fail-son Western quote-unquote leftists who are too anxious to order a pizza over the phone, who feel desperately hopeless about the current state of affairs and need something to believe in. And when people need something to believe in, the easiest thing to fall into is a cult that is preaching, like, the... Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the supremacy of an idea or of a person or of a concept or of a structure. And in this case, it's like American diabolism. That is the thing that they are meant to fall into. Uh, hating America is like the gateway drug. And by the way, hating America in and of itself is fine, but it's a gateway drug in this case to defending fascism, much in the same way that believing the media is run by elites can be a gateway drug into Nazism, depending on which conspiracy theorists drag you in. To be fair to Engels, I don't think the modern definition of authoritarian had consolidated yet. That is true. A good example of this would be the term dictatorship of the proletariat. When that term was created, dictatorship didn't mean what it means today. It literally just meant a society controlled by the proletariat. Like, a proletarian democracy would be a dictatorship of the proletariat in its conceptualization, like, as the term was originally conceived. But, you know, language changes. Authoritarian means, if such there be at all. And if the victorious party does not want to have fought in vain, it must maintain this rule by means of the terror which its arms inspire in the reactionists. Uh, so this is just, so this is like, no excusing this here, this is just bad logic from, from Engels. The idea that in order to maintain your rule, you have to terrorize the, you, you, in order to maintain your rule after a revolution, you have to do the same thing that the people before you did. If you apply this to a racial lens, you immediately see how bad this is. Like, oh, Okay, so black liberation must necessarily entail white slavery? What does that mean? Like, literally, what the f*** does that mean? Like, are you arguing that any, like, group of people achieving power and prominence must necessarily commit the expense of another group? That's the conservative argument. The conservative argument is that if the oppressed people ever have their way, they would simply make the oppressors the oppressed. That's, this is like like fear of reprisal, white supremacist, we can never let the Native Americans have anything language right here. And it's being cited in defense of communism. Would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day if it had not made use of this authority of the armed people against the bourgeois? That's not what authority is. That would be force. And also it's not authoritarian to um, uh, uh, overthrow the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the authoritarian class. Should we not, on the contrary, reproach it for not having used it freely enough? 
Therefore, either one of two things. Either also, I like the implication that the problem with the French Revolution is that they weren't liberal enough in their use of violent reprisal against the people they overthrew. Like, yeah, I just just finished reading my history book in the French Revolution. My main issue with them, the main problem that I have, is that they didn't engage in enough uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, broad, unconditional execution. They, 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 they should have been less discerning. The Paris Commune. Oh, did he say Paris Commune? Am I stupid? Oh, the Paris Commune. My apologies. Though, keep in mind that his logic here would have also referred to the French Revolution. There were many problems with the Paris Commune, and this was not one of them. The anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about, in which case they're creating nothing but confusion, or they do know, and in that case they are betraying the movement of the proletariat. I think a better argument to be made here would be interpreting what Engels said as anti-pacifism, which actually makes a lot more sense. He would argue, if you want to engage in revolutionary behavior, you have to abandon pacifism because only violence can like secure the rights of the uh, working class or whatever. And I think there's definitely truth to that, especially in the time that he wrote it. But that doesn't really speak to authoritarianism. That's just anti-pacifism. In either case, they serve the reaction. While it might not feel good to be called out from beyond the grave, it's so important that we understand what Engels was talking about here. Because it's still true today. If a mass of people decide they're done with the current oppressive system, rise up, build something new, and then fail to protect the gains they've made... Yes, but will we not crack down on fascist movements in a socialist society, or is that something different? First of all, if you're doing things right, there shouldn't be a fascist movement in a socialist society. Second of all, it's not authoritarian to crack down on counter-revolutionaries. The problem is, is that heads like this call everything counter-revolutionary. Stalin was a counter-revolutionary. Lenin was a counter-revolutionary. They immediately betrayed their principles the moment they had the authority to. But if, like, th this would be like the argument that, like, arresting January 6 protesters is authoritarian. It's not. Like, obviously. The problem is, by roping literally everything anyone does under revisionism or under counter-revolutionary behavior, the consequence of this is that you, um, you give like, people like Stalin free reign to kill like a million people in the Great Purge, right? This is why you have to be careful with your language when it comes to defending the authority of states, something you'd think socialists would be more careful about, considering the fact that the state is literally the bedrock upon which capital and proletarian oppression is built, according to Karl Marx. So, but, but like people, you know, like we should be, you know, maybe a little, a little careful. Their project will be destroyed. We've seen it many times throughout history. The reactionary elements in society won't go away. And people with wealth and power before the revolution will still have that wealth. And will have likely fled somewhere like the US where they can agitate for military or CIA intervention. This was the case. So this is, this is, um, identical to the arguments Nazis make, by the way. He's essentially making the, um, uh, um, uh, the uh, cultural Marxism argument, except from the opposite side of things. He's basically saying any number of secret police and mass executions is justified as long as you can vaguely nebulously refer to some external force that's trying to bring us down. Um, I've seen it, you, like, I have literally had an argument with a Stalinist who argued that the Soviet Union had to illegalize, uh, uh, had to criminalize homosexuality in order to defend against bourgeois degeneracy. Which is like, you're just being a Nazi at that point. Like, you're literally just doing the cultural Bolshevism argument, except the cultural Bolsheviks are coming from the West instead of the Soviet Union at that point. That's basically what they believe. Because if you take a look at the actual, like, purges and insane shit that, that like, the Soviet Union or China did, if you take a look at the stuff they did, it is impossible to believe that behavior was done to defend their country against foreign intervention. It does, like, it literally, there's no correlation. It doesn't track. There are plenty of times that they engaged in purges or monstrous behavior or deportations or mass executions entirely based on the fervent paranoia or will of their leaders or just, like, irrational behaviors, decision-making. And then, like, it, and, and then they have to defend that. They have to argue, well, actually, these decisions were the totally logical and necessary outcome uh, in order to prevent this, that, the other. Many such cases. You know, the reason why Mao let, like, 30 million people starve to death by trying to get people who worked the farms to create pig iron was actually to defend them against Western intervention. In Chile in 1973, when the democratically elected socialist president Salvador Allende failed to take preventative measures to ensure the vicious reactionary class and their U.S.-based co-conspirators couldn't undermine them. Long story short, the Chilean right wing launched a U.S.-backed and U.S.-funded coup to overthrow the government, eliminate Allende, and install a fascist military dictatorship that plunged the country into recession and suffering for decades. This is completely true. This would be an example of a legitimate uh, effort taken 
for a socialist leader to attempt to defend their... First of all, I do think it's funny that earlier Second Thought said you can't vote out your oppressors, but now he's arguing that Allende, who was voted in, was, like, doing that. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit of, like, contradictory anti... Remember, anti-electoralism, unless it's in the, like, 1960s Latin America, in which case, forget all that. Uh, this would be an example where greater protective measures would have been perfectly warranted. I don't know if they would have worked, but they would have been warranted. And there are times that I've defended that as well. In Cuba, I've defended that with, um, uh, in Burkina Faso, with Thomas Sankara. Uh, the problem is, again, that because we're equivocating, we're painting over everything, it's like, oh, because this one Latin American leader was cooed, that means that Stalin had a right to kill one million people in the purges, you know? You understand how he's doing this, right? By being really vague and generalizing and saying, well, actually, by defending the revolution and taking steps to protect your gains, you're actually doing something necessary. We're kind of painting over the horrors that actually took place as a product of that thinking. In order to avoid this happening, a budding socialist project, or heck, any project, requires police, it requires the shutting down of reactionary outlets, the banning of certain kinds of speech, there's a reason- Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Notice the vagueness again, the banning of certain kinds of speech. Germany banned everything related to the Nazis, for example, it's because they wanted to keep that sentiment from spreading as much as possible. And the Nazis banned everything relating to communism. No, you, you're, you're defending the tactics they used. The, the attitude that the Nazis took against commies was much more in line with what the Soviets did to their counter-revolutionaries, quote-unquote, than what the modern German government did to the Nazis after World War II. Like, what, like, I like, he's literally showing, like, a bunch of Nazis marching and describing, in positive terms, something the Nazis did. It requires an intelligence apparatus to listen for terrorist plots, which were all- Terrorist plots?! Whoa, 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 Terrorism isn't what has historically brought down democratically elected leaders. It's coups. Why are you doing war on terror shit? What? Do you have any idea what kind of surveillance apparatus is necessary to meaningfully combat even the possibility of terrorism? Yeah, these are Chinese talking points. Actually, we need to be the most surveilled country in the world because we need to protect uh, the Xinjiang province from being uh, terroristed by Uyghur Muslims or whatever. Too common post-revolution. In East Germany, the reactionaries would routinely attempt to blow up civilian train lines. It requires prisons to keep these people off the streets. And historically speaking, the socialists have been much better at using prisons for rehabilitation rather than just packing human beings away to rot like- Does it require extrajudicial executions or secret police listening in on all your conversations and black bagging you if you disagree with the regime? Notice again, nobody's problem with socialist countries, socialist, is that they arrested people plotting to blow up trains. When have you heard that? When have you heard anybody say, like, oh yeah, my big issue with the Soviet Union was because they arrested people who tried to blow up trains. Why is he not talking about the people who were mass executed and disappeared for political dissidents? Oh, almost because he's trying to avoid that point and equivocate everything. Wait, I thought the Patriot Act was bad, bro, lol. Yeah, I thought the Patriot Act was bad. Wait, wasn't the Patriot Act bad? Now he's like, actually, we need surveillance networks to defend ourselves against terrorism. Again, notice how he doesn't have any actual principled beliefs. It doesn't make any sense. Literally, he's like, the Patriot Act is bad because the government is spying on us in order to quote-unquote protect us from surveillance, but also the f East Germans needed surveillance networks to protect- Like, what, what do you- what, what do you believe? We do in the US. These things may not be morally correct, but like it or not, they are necessary. Ah, ah, okay, ah, all right. Literally just war on terror rhetoric. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the American Patriot Act, uh, Patriot Act is bad, but when we do it, actually, it's necessary. You, you, you whiny anarchists might complain about secret police, prisons, and surveillance networks, but, you know, when we do it, it's, uh, yeah, well, have you considered the Patriot Act is bad because it's American? As opposed to when we do things? When it's not American, it's different then. It's not American, but when you do it, it is American, so it's different. And that's something that every system has agreed on. I would love nothing more than to see an alternative work but it never has. Remember, don't believe in better things. Capitalist realism, don't believe in better things. You you don't want to be disappeared by police? Sorry, what are you, some kind of anarchy? Go go back to go back to protesting bedtimes, anarchy. You don't want giant surveillance networks from states that meticulously document like dissident political speech and arrest you and disappear your family? <laughs> What are, what are you, some kind of child? What are you, some kind of, you got your head in the clouds, anarchy. Face the wall. Oh, wow, you're in, you're in the, uh, uh, you're in like, 1930s Spain and you think there's a better way to manage like a socialist Spain than just like following the Stalinist wrote and purging dissidents? Face the wall! 
oh, you participated in the uh, the Bolshevik Revolution to help overthrow the Tsar, but you're an anarchist and don't think Lenin should have absolute power after the Bolsheviks take charge? Face the wall! Oh, you're Stalin and you don't like the idea that there are old, like, Lenin loyalists who might challenge your rule because they sympathize more with Lenin's rule than yours? Face the wall! Actually, nothing better is possible. Nothing better is possible. Everything will be bad forever and nothing else is realistic, Anarchy. Go back to debating your bedtimes. Of course, we do already have an example of a better society than the ones he's describing. It's called the United States of America. Every single thing that he's talking about and every element from the secret police to the surveillance, we have it better than the East Germans did. We have it better than the Soviets did. We have it better than China does. So, you know. Maybe one day I'll be proven wrong. That would be amazing. But to the people who believe it is possible, you need to ask yourself how it's going to happen. Yeah, you don't support the Iranian morality police suppressing homosexuality because it's a sign of Western degeneracy. Wow, you're so unrealistic, bro. It's the same argument they make, by the way. When, when, like, uh, when, like, Ugandan politicians say that they want to kill all the homosexuals in their country because they're a sign of Western disease, they're making the same argument. They're saying that there is a rot that spreads across the world in the form of liberalism, and that's exactly what this guy is saying. And the only way to protect yourself from it is any measure of monstrous authoritarian behavior you can possibly engage in. Like, Anything is acceptable. He hasn't condemned the purges. He hasn't even mentioned the purges because he supports the purges, but he doesn't want to bring them up because they look really bad. It would look really bad for him to be like, yeah, so anyway, the million dead for no reason? Yeah, yeah, well, that's necessary too. So that just gets left to implication. But otherwise, this is, yeah, this is the globo homo conspiracy theory, 100%. Do you think he believes the things he says? I don't really know. He doesn't seem very smart to me, so it's difficult for me to determine. Like, a person who's very like him but is smarter is Nick Fuentes. And I know that Nick Fuentes knows that he's lying because Nick Fuentes isn't stupid. He's just gay and retarded. Whereas this guy's probably just retarded. I don't know. I'm getting straight man fit from this, which is a symptom of um, Western degeneracy as well. Imagine being a hat. I don't really know. I don't know how much. I know that he knows he's lying, but my bet is that he thinks that he's telling a fundamental truth while lying about the details, which is what all liars believe, by the way. Like every big, like every Nazi I've debated who f flag like uh, flagrantly lies d d believes they're lying about the details to serve an underlying truth. That's just what liars believe, basically. It's very, very, very rare. It's very rare for somebody to be so shiftless of a grifter that they know they don't believe anything. I think Jackson Hinkle would be a good example of that. But again, I'm just guessing. I don't know. This is supposedly Hassan's favorite YouTuber, by the way. That's because Hassan Piker has soup for brain, and he, fa he like, pathetically falls into the ideological orbit of people who are more forceful than him. He just wants to be an e-boy celebrity and more ideologically forceful people, like this guy, the Deprogram podcast, whatever, can enter his orbit, pull him in their direction, and then he'll defend it to his audience. Um, he doesn't have, like, the, 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 the backbone to, uh, to defend himself. I don't think that Hassan understands the degree to which he lies when he talks about China or whatever. Re remember when we saw that Hassan clip and it was a bunch of, like, poor, like, like, people sitting on the street doing phone shit, like, like, influencer shit underneath a bridge in China? And it would be dystopian if seen in America, but then he, like, saw in the clip that it was China. He was like, yo, China has Wi-Fi under bridges? Oh! Xi Jinping, shit in my mouth, dog. Oh, Western society is 3,000 years behind China. Like, literally, like, it was so f dumb. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, that was actually insane. No, literally, it was f insane. Like, with no, like, it, it, oh my God, I can't even. I, it's, dude, it's so f bad here, man. We've seen what the people in Tsarist Russia had to do. We've seen what the Cubans had to do. Yeah, we saw what Lenin had to do, where he immediately disbanded workers' councils and killed uh, his allies because he wanted to consolidate power. And then he immediately, like, failed to do all the stuff that he promised, and the uh, proletariat never, uh, you know, uh, took control of the Soviet Union. Also, yeah, the language had to do. Mm-hmm. We've seen what the Vietnamese had to do, what the Chinese had to do, what- Yeah, mm-hmm. Yep. Chinese had to kill tens of millions of people. There was no other way. Vietnamese had to had to engage in Ho Chi Minh's vaunted um, random killing policy that he later apologized for. There was no other option, guys. Sorry, sorry. There was no other option. The Americans had to do to separate from the British. Your anti-authority. What did the Americans have to do? What what comparison are we drawing here exactly? Like, what does he think the Americans had to do that are similar to what Mao had to do? Like what? Like I'm, I'm genuinely curious what he thinks the like comparison there is. You know, what about like the continued eradication of the native people? 
because the Soviets displaced millions of ethnic minorities, we did as well. So, like, was that fine when we did it? The Soviets so-called, they, they did it to protect the revolution. Was Manifest Destiny not just a way of protecting the American dream? So millions of people had to be displaced? Natives were counter-revolutionary? Yeah! Natives were counter-revolutionary, dude, literally. The American Revolution secured in its government certain principles that had to be protected, and the only way for them to protect it was to secure more land, which they did through Louisiana Purchase and the westward expansion, the Mexican War. Like, why not? Like, is it any difference from what he's, uh, from what he's saying? I'm genuinely asking. Like, is it any different? It's not. The only, the only real difference that you could sort of cobble, the only, like, real argument that you could make would be like, oh, well the Soviets were doing it for something better than the Americans. Like, their project was worth killing millions of people for. Which, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Bosh, I feel like uh, you assume anyone watching your vids have been watching you for a while and are beyond normie status. When I first started watching you, I was a liberal supporting capitalism. It feels like you dismiss a lot that I wouldn't understand back then. Things that are highlighted in this video that most normies do. Uh, what, do, what do you think that I've skipped over? I guess I'm mostly concerned with criticizing this guy from, like, a leftist perspective against a fascist. But, like, what you mean, you mean like specific criticisms of the way capitalism functions? Because that feels like it's more of a different subject, you know? I don't actually know what like a liberal capitalist would take out of this video. I guess a liberal capitalist would look at me and go like, oh wow, one of the sane ones, finally. Like, they would look at Second Thought and go like, wow, this guy's just like the Nazis. And then they would look at me and go, oh, this guy seems like a more sane socialist, which is a comment that I get a lot. But you guys only think that because I'm not talking about my whole I want the government to force worker co-op everyone uh, bit. So, like, I don't really know. The, the truth is, is that, like, w along with all political changes, like, literally all political uh, paradigm shifts involve some degree of violence and coercion, even if it's the implicit violence of, like, a policy change, in the same way that you could argue that, say, changing policy when it comes to, like, food distribution or healthcare is social violence, depending on its outcomes. I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with violence, because violence is often done for good, like Ukraine's doing violence against Russia. R Russia doing violence against Ukraine is bad. But Ukraine doing violence to defend itself against Russia is good. So, like, you know, it's a violence is a tool. You have to do a good job. Dust, ju God, I can't talk at all today. I didn't sleep. You have to do a good job justifying that violence, though. You can't just sort of, like, flippantly, like, Neh, you know. And what the language of this video is telling me is that there is an unlimited threshold for violence that he believes a so-called socialist state could engage in and be justified. When America does the Patriot Act, it's bad. But when the Soviet Union, like, kills a million political dissidents, that's what they had to do to survive. And what this tells me, again, is that he doesn't have any real principles in, like, a, like a, a normative sense. The only thing he really believes is that America is bad and that these countries that he likes are good. It's a pretty common belief. This kind of, like, ultra-campus team sports attitude towards politics has probably been the default throughout most of human history, you know? It's not super unique here, but that doesn't make it any less monstrous. Authoritarianism, while I genuinely- We gotta finish this video, dog. We gotta get out. We believe it comes from a good place is handing an easy victory to the capitalist regime. They want you to play by their rules. It's their game. You play by their rules, you lose. End of story. Don't kill political dissidents. They, they lose. They win. Whatever. <laughs> One final thing that's important to note is that this anti-authoritarian stance is very much a Western thing. And I think the- Oh my god. Dude, there are so many actual leftists in China that have been disappeared or arrested for criticizing the CCP for not being a socialist organization. This shit is actually racist, unironically. No lie, what he's about to do is, well, you see, all the blacks and browns of the world actually don't believe in your degenerate Western democratic value. Now, I, as a good white, do believe in it. I know that all the people of Africa and Asia, every single one of them, actually know that having a glorious leader is the best thing for their society. It's you who is racist. Like, the the, the belief that um, every Chinese person is like an ant in a hive mind who all uncritically accept the ideological precepts of the CCP is very common to tankies in the same way that Nazis have to pretend that every, like, white person has a shared set of values. It's an extremely racist, orientalist, otherizing, uh, or, or othering, I guess, uh, way of thinking about politics. I have literally seen online, I think I had this argued to me, that, like, my ideas about socialism were bad because all 1.4 billion Chinese people thought differently. Like, how can you be right when 1.4 billion Chinese people think differently? Which is such a racist statement that it's actually, like, jaw-dropping. But a lot of them believe that. He believes that. 
He might not say it in that direct language, but he does believe it. The hive mind. The reason for that is that we here in the Imperial Corps are in a very privileged position. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's gonna, I, he's gonna say it. We can hold these naive beliefs because we don't have any skin in the game. These naive beliefs that, again, secret uh, police, gulags, imprisonment, torture, and extrajudicial executions are bad. Again, that's what he means by naive beliefs. You pathetic uh, Western lefty, you anarchid, you, you, you naive fool, you believe that socialism can happen, but I understand that it can't. And the, the others, the Orientals, they understand how socialism works. All you need to do is give up all your rights and accept total state and police control. They're willing to do that. Why aren't you? They understand the true nature of man. You don't. You're just a privileged Western lefty. I say, obviously, being an upper middle class white person who would never live in the societies that I'm defending right now because I'd be arrested after a short while. You are the ones. We're not the ones under the boot. We're not the ones whose resources are being extracted, or whose homes are being bombed, or whose cities are being occupied by armed invaders in the name of freedom and democracy. We have the luxury of condemning others because we've never been on the receiving end. Think for Again, framing this in condemnation of others. Notice, notice how he's engaging in personhood and essentialization there. The Chinese government is not an other to be condemned. It's a state to be critiqued. Condemning is something you do to people. It's a moral judgment against a person. And it's not a person. It's not an other. It's a state. You, it doesn't matter how poor a state is. You can critique it all you want. Should I not critique Uganda for the anti-gay shit because they're poorer than me? Oh, sorry. Uganda's resources are being extracted. So their plan to f behead all gay people is actually... Oh, sorry, guys. You know... <sighs> Eastern Syria and Iraq are so deprived. How could I possibly criticize ISIS? Literally, that is the argument that is being made here. And it's being made very disingenuously as well, because the people who are making policy decisions in China are not poor Chinese proletariat. They're very wealthy, extremely powerful. The kind of power held by officials of the CCP is beyond anything you could f imagine. The wealthy people over here in America are at least nominatively beholden to our laws, though in practice very rarely are, but there are limits. And our politicians get in trouble for minor shit all the time. A Communist Party official, through the union of state and corporate power, which is, by the way, one of the definitions of fascism, has a kind of power you could not fathom. Imagine how much power a Kremlin oligarch has. They are gods in Russia. Putin most of all, but broadly, it's a problem. They can do whatever they want. A Saudi emirate? A prince? You have no idea how powerful these people are. And when you criticize the decision-making and behavior of Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, whatever, you are not criticizing or, I'm sorry, condemning the poor, oppressed people of those nations. You are criticizing and condemning the bloated, wealthy who exploit them. Just a moment, what it would be like if your neighborhood was occupied by a foreign military force, doing unspeakable things to your friends and loved ones, taking your belongings, burning homes, torturing people in the name of national security. What means would you resort to? Wait, you situation? were just you were just defending torturing people in the name of national security. What are you what what occupying force are you referring to here? The Stasi? The NKVD? What are you what you were just defending it? You were just doing that. You were just, oh, bro, we have to, with me when my village is being ransacked by, by, by Chinese or Soviet officials. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And they're like, actually, we need to do this because I don't know, there might be like Westerners here or something. Bro, isn't he pro-Russia as well? Yes. I can't answer that for you, but it's something to think about. I know this has been kind of a heavy video. And for a lot of you, I'm sure this is the first time you've been asked to look at your home country more critically. If I wouldn't say heavy, more, uh, more dense. For a lot of you, this is the first time you've been thought to uh, think of your country critically. This is a uh, cult language. So you know how uh, in cults they will constantly repeat like uh, syllogisms or, or, or like catchphrases that feel like they should be really self-evident and are kind of patronizing? Like a cultist will go up there on stage and they'll be like, uh, now how, how many of you feel like you're not living up to your potential? I know you've heard before, you have to settle for your life. And you're thinking like rationally from a distance, who is, who's this person talking to? Like, this person is just reiterating internal monologues that every human had at five. Like, does that make any sense? Like, you, you're, 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 
you're not saying anything novel. Like anyone who's watching a video from Second Thought called We Need to Talk About Authoritarianism is probably familiar with a criticism of the Patriot Act, you know? And if they're not, they're probably not going to mount a gigantic like defense of it, you know? It's it's not like the reason he speaks this way is because he's doing inductee language to baby socialists who he's trying to groom. Do you understand? Now, hey, I know this might be your first encounter with this language, and then you, the baby socialist viewer, are supposed to be, no, no, I, I knew the Patriot Act was bad. I knew police were bad. I know I know more than that. I'm knowledgeable. Yeah. And and then like the 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 context, the guiding line for the video then is now that you have proven to the video that you know more than he thinks that you do, that means that you are deserving of a higher level of understanding of this. If, li if, if little, like, nobody baby socialists can understand the content of this video, that shouldn't you be able to? I feel like I'm doing a bad job explaining this because I'm not really that um, familiar with, like, the specific language of cult dynamics. But does everyone understand what I'm talking about here? The way it's being framed, the reason these, like, very obvious statements are being made is to, is to try to onboard you. It's the same thing Tucker Carlson does. Tucker Carlson will do this, you know, this, like... I don't know about you, but I don't agree with it. I think America should be this and this. And it's like everyone who's listening to this already agrees with what you're saying. Why are you repeating it? Well, he's repeating it because, you know, to weak-willed people, this kind of stuff really works. Yeah, extreme flattery for basic knowledge and compliance. Thank you, Jetfire. In one sentence, you demolish my wordy bullshit. Extreme flattery for basic knowledge and compliance. This is this is a clear-cut example because I was just criticized for not even remotely doing this five minutes ago. When I do my videos, I very rarely do this like beginners 101 stuff in the language that he's doing. Sometimes I'll introduce a concept, but I'll never say something like, you've probably never heard criticisms of the American government before because that's a really stupid thing to say, you know? That would be really patronizing and I think you guys would call me out for it. You would be like, come on, like seriously? Like, even if a person never had heard criticisms of the U.S. government before, which, first of all, how? But, like, even if they genuinely hadn't, I feel like they could get along with what I'm saying without me having to, like, reach down and hold their hand like that. But again, if your goal is to ideologically groom people, you need that, as you said, extreme uh, reward for compliance and knowledge. Yes. If you're interested in learning more about any of the stuff we've talked about, there are links in the description. We all have a responsibility to choose our words carefully, apply labels correctly, and hold our own nations to the same standard we expect others to meet. Maybe it's time we retire the word authoritarian and try to engage with the facts more precisely, more honestly, and in good faith. Notice how he didn't engage with any specific detail of any element of any society that he's ostensibly defending here. And also, notice how, uh, for some reason, his video critiquing the use of the word authoritarian doesn't, doesn't involve any kind of, like, criticism of the Nazis. Genuinely, I want to know what his criticism of the Nazis would be if you left out the Holocaust. Genuinely asking, by the way. So from, like, I don't know, go from, like, 33 up to 39 or something. What issues do you have with their behavior? Like, for, like, really? I'm, I'm genuinely asking. So the Nazis had secret police. Okay. They engaged in selective ethnic oppression on the basis of national security. The Soviets and Chinese did that as well. The Chinese still do this. Guys, the Chinese engaged in selective oppression of a different ethnic group just two years ago. And this guy defended and denied it. It literally just happened. The Chinese government just did it to the Uyghur Muslims and he defended it. So on what grounds would he criticize the Nazis? They, they didn't make industry public? You know what? The Soviets didn't either. Neither did China. Unironically, yeah, because post-World War I, Germany was also economically repressed by the rest of the West. That's true. A lot of people were responsible for what happened in World War I, and Germany did get the shit end of the stick when it came to repayments, and they felt pretty uh, embittered by that. So, like, how does this... Like, his narrative works perfectly well with the big lie. The only difference, the only, like... Uh, the only, like, underlying criticism that he would have, I guess, is that the big lie was directed against Jewish people rather than being sort of nebulously directed against a collection of political and ethnic enemies that the Soviet government targeted. The repayment thing is overstated. Oh, to be clear, because Nazis will go on and on about this, the, the repayment stuff is absolutely overstated. Um, it is probably something the Western powers blame Germany a bit too much for because a lot of people fucked up in World War One, but like it's heavily overstated for propaganda purposes. I don't mean to imply that Germany was like a victim in World War One, only that like, so he just flips the coin. No, he doesn't flip the coin. He just defends non-Western countries. Why do people become tankies? The same reason people become fascists. Honestly, I think that tanky is just like contrarian fascism. 
Like, you get to do and believe all the same basic things, but with more self-delusion, and you get to distinguish yourself from your parents. This guy probably grew up wealthy. Doesn't somebody say he has, like, a second channel dedicated to classic cars or something? Something tells me this guy grew up pretty wealthy, so I'm guessing that a lot of this is just like, I'm gonna do fascism, but my shitty, bougie, liberal parents aren't, aren't, aren't yeah, meh, you know. He does? Okay, nice. As an ex-tanky, he was trying to pull his best friend out of Xi Jinping's Nazbol Vortex. Thank you for this, Fox. Yeah, I guess it's just like, this. there's a reason why, like, I, the, like these people don't want to talk to me, I guess. And it's not even because I'm super crazy well-educated on the Soviet Union or China. Like, I am more so than the average person, of course. But it's because their propaganda relies on you not knowing anything, you know? Much in the same way that Nazis don't actually know that much about Nazi Germany. Like, if you actually sat a Nazi down and were like, okay, let's go over, like, tw 10 years of, like, specific policy and stuff, they wouldn't know, right? The thing they like is the vibes. They like the idea of a state defending their, namely, white men's interests. They like the idea of retributive violence being engaged in against groups they don't like, namely Jews, communists, whatever. They, they like that stuff, so they defend Nazis because it fits within that metric, um, much the same case here. But, like, they don't know much in the way of details. This is the result of Akeem essentially re-educating him. He bragged about taking him, quote, under my wing on multiple occasions. Nice. Why, the, uh, another, another thing that it's important to remember about fascists is that they are uh, submissive people. And don't, like, I don't mean that in some, like, meme sexual way. I mean their ideology literally makes them vulnerable to grooming and direction by people who are more strong-willed than they are. It makes sense that a, like, anti-Kurdish, pan-Arabist racist would be able to take over the brain of this pathetic, simpering white boy. Um, but, like, this is the case with basically all fascist groups. This is the same reason why Republicans seem so gung-ho when it comes to oppressing other groups, but when it comes to submitting themselves to Trump, they all do it. Like, Ted Cruz had his wife made fun of by Trump, and then Ted Cruz, this big Christian strongman, this intelligent, educated, genteel... Uh, like politician who, if made president, would be monstrous for our country, he bent the knee to Trump. You take a look at all of these like hyper individualist Republican politicians, and it turns out that all of them bend the knee. And that's because fascists are just submissive people. They're cucks. They're very they're authoritarians, and authoritarians, by design, are very susceptible to like sort of taking the knee to people stronger than them. Please let me out of this video. This is a really interesting topic when you dig into it, and as you might expect, vaguely using take a secret boogeyman. Better, 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 better. I always recommend people check out Ground News because it has. Uh, okay, yeah, it's the sponsor read. Speaking of rich tank users, you'll never guess who works for Nike. Oh, yeah, I saw this. This like obnoxious TikTok guy who does the over edited Zoomer videos apparently is a digital advertising strategist for Nike or something. I don't I don't think there's anything ideologically contradictory or wrong with having a high profile corporate job and being a commie. I don't think there's anything wrong with being that. However, he probably does. So I think that's funny. Man, that took too long. All right, did everyone get their nice, like, good fill of anti-red fascism for a little while? I feel like I stumbled over a lot of my words because I'm pretty tired right now, but I just want you guys to understand, like, fundamentally, all right? Socialism is a battle for control against people like that as much as it is a battle for control against, like, Trump or the other Western fascists, okay? The difference is in countries like Russia and China, they already lost. The fascists won. The fascists won with Stalin back in the Soviet Union and with, again with Putin and the Russian Federation. And they lost a long time ago with Mao in China and have continued to lose nonstop, nothing but losing. They lost these battles. What we have here in the West is precious. The ability to freely speak our mind without being blackbagged by the government. This is a privilege and a right that Karl Marx had to move several times to protect. Karl Marx, the father of most modern socialist movements, had to move because he was the subject of scrutiny for many intelligence agencies in the countries that he occupied. And my man didn't want to get blackbagged, which they definitely would have done to him. Um, but he managed to live and he managed to write. And that freedom that he was given, the freedom that he took for himself, that allowed him to write, is the reason we have these movements today. And when so-called socialists just break down, just fall to their knees to suck the cocks of authoritarian countries, just bowl over all their monstrous human rights abuses, all their civil rights violations, the fact that they have no freedom of speech, they're doing a disservice to Karl Marx and his legacy. What we have here is a precious glittering jewel in the dark. Western democracy, bourgeois democracy sucks, but it's also the best platform we've ever had. And we cannot allow it to be to be ceded to, to those people, to cynics and fascists who don't actually believe in a better world. I mean, you heard it from him himself. Like he preaches optimism in the American experiment. And then he goes around and says, oh, sorry, Anarchy, you don't want secret police. 
What are you, naive? What are you, unrealistic? Go back to debating your bedtimes. Real socialists know that secret police are the only way to achieve socialism. These people are at best cynical and at worst fascists who lie. They wear a wolf's cloak, um, or sorry, a sheep's cloak and uh, a wolf underneath to deceive you. Just always be careful about them. And always, 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 always make sure just because a person agrees with you on something does not mean that you're allies. Why they agree is critical. A Nazi will tell you they think the media is corrupt and run by elites, but if you ask them to explain why, you'll quickly find out why you two aren't allies. Likewise with these guys. They don't have an issue with the Patriot Act because they have an issue with government control or surveillance. They have an issue with America. They have an issue with America because America is the geopolitic, you know, it's, it's a global enemy of nations like Russia and China. So just always make sure. When a person says, hey, American police shoot too many people, that's true. But then dig a little deeper. Why are they saying that? Do they actually have a problem with police shooting people? No, he doesn't care about the Great Purge under Stalin. What they actually uh, uh, care about is American police shooting people. He doesn't give a shit about Chinese or Russian police shooting people. You know, always know why it's happening. It's important, okay? You have to know why. I think a lot of this could also be understood in the context of Hassan's ideological degradation from decent sock dem to occasional socialists to sometimes a socialist in American domestic issues, but absolute simpering weakling when it comes to anything associated with non-American, like non-Western countries. Um, you have to understand the deeps. You have to understand the, the underlying groundwork.